I'd like to take a few minutes before we actually start into the presentation uh, to give a little bit of background of where I'm coming from professionally, etc. Uh, so without further ado, let me just note that uh, I grew up in a very conservative religious family, but with a background that I've been thankful for the rest of my life because of the tolerance and the uh, willingness to be open and talk and the kinds of things that you guys do here. Uh, I had a lot to learn when I started teaching, and I go back a long ways. My first year of teaching was in 1962. That fall at Walla Walla College, I had a very fast learning experience uh, because I hadn't really taught in an environment where people would put more put more into what you're saying. Uh, uh, let me just give you an anecdote. Uh, my first year on the campus of Walla Walla College, I got involved with teaching general biology, which was a lot of fun. And my relatively recent PhD, as in uh, less than a year before I started there, pardon me, I forgot to do one thing. I want to get this off so it doesn't interrupt me in the middle. Uh, so just sort of getting used to uh, being around, I taught in the general biology course. I'd just come out of a PhD and a lot of happening was happening around that time. Some really exciting things. As an animal behaviorist, which was my background at the time, I was just so excited on stuff coming out that I thought was wondrous and told us that our God had a lot packed into the simplest organisms. I remember lecturing in the course and with a great deal of enthusiasm telling the classes about how we had just discovered that some passerine birds, if you put them in a, in a uh, Solarium, oh, pardon me, the word? Planetarium. Planetarium. Uh, if you put them in planetarium, give them star patterns, their, their restlessness becomes oriented. And if you begin to track the direction of the restlessness, it matched the direction they would be, in fact, migrating in flight in that particular geographical location. And so I was exulting about all the beauties of what was built into these organisms and how uh, it was an indication of the complexity and the planning of life from a creator. At the end of the lecture, I'm going to say it this way, I was cornered by one of the students wasn't a biology major, and I, maybe I, I have to go further. Uh, he was a theology major. And he got me in a corner and said, you can't do that. That's wrong. You're trying to say that we can understand what God did. And God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> I'm totally blown away, but as I said, it's a very fast learning curve. Uh, and I also, uh, maybe somewhat naively, would take invitations to talk about origins in Adventist church groups that did not know me. I found very quickly that unless they knew me, what I needed to tell them would upset many. So frankly, I quit doing it. I found that when people knew me and trusted me, then we could do it. That's the only reason I'm in this group, but I've been down that road a long ways. So we do come with those kinds of experiences and backgrounds, learning to be cautious. <clears throat> and I would like to add at this point, 
I've included in the presentation some video clips from students I knew very well, relevant to origins. Why do I have them? Uh, some of you are probably aware, maybe you are all aware, that in the early 2000s, the Adventist Church had worldwide and division-wide meetings on origins, trying to come to a conclusion. Uh, I was asked to participate as an organizer in the second of those, which was North American Division. And uh, I was in charge of putting together the first meeting, general meeting we had. And since I had been at the time, I was at the time, involved with our senior students discussing origins in a seminar type environment, I asked some of them to participate in the presentation via video clips. And that's where these video clips are coming from. Uh, several of these will be people you may very well know, even though they were uh, Andrews University graduates. But uh, I just want, want to say that they are comfortable with this presentation, although I would be uncomfortable if my presentation as I'm giving it today went online and these people were talking. I, I forgot to mention that to you, Paul. I, I would rather that this presentation, as I'm giving it, not go on the website because I don't have permission from these people to have their statements shared widely that way without any context or, or ability to do it. So let's get started. Um, there is some history. Uh, at the time... I joined Andrews University, uh, which was in 1970. I might say parenthetically, I'd been fortunate in obtaining a senior postdoctoral fellowship from the National Institute of Mental Health, which gave me a year in Europe because I wanted to become a neuroscientist, uh, not, not if I may say it this way, not just in my own behaviors. I wanted to dig in, and so. Uh, I had that opportunity, and uh, Andrews hired me and put me on half salary while I was in Europe doing that. And it was a wonderful environment. But when I got back, um, I don't know if, how many of you were connected at that time, but there was a lot of discussion that very much involved some of the faculty in the biology department at Andrews at that time. And that went on for a while. Uh, the Many of the faculty had been there for a long time. In fact, our faculty in biology was always very stable. I think we had two replacements in my 17 years as chair. But anyway, uh, the department was involved, and I really don't want to go there in terms of what those discussions were all about. But when I was asked to become chair in the early 80s, there was a core group of us who wanted to, I don't want to say make a fresh start, but put a program together that was overtly supportive of creation, but overtly respected good science at the same time. And that may sound like it's not possible. We found that it probably was. and. Uh, then we organize the program in a way that I'll be showing you. Uh, I have no formal training in paleobiology or biogeography or any of those areas, but if you're going to be involved in a Christian Adventist environment and education, you better be understanding. And part of what we did, as I'll point out to you, is to have a senior capstone that we spent a quarter discussing origin and I was involved in that so I knew the students very well I actually had them all in classes before but uh, that that's the background of this presentation uh, at the time uh, just before my chairmanship in the early 1980s late 79s the uh, a number of the faculty were reaching retirement age and so those of us who uh, 
were going on and wanted to become more constructive in the churches and our science view of origins uh, got together. Uh, in particular, I don't know you know Dr. Bill Chobatar, but uh, Bill was one of my best friends and on the faculty and one of the best faculty members Andrew's ever had. And so we, without going into names and details, decided to put in place a new program. It was an ideal time to do it and leave the other discussions behind. Uh, in some ways, I, well, I shouldn't say in some ways, having gone through that, I understood perhaps more than most the problems going on at La Sierra. And I, uh, I'd just like to say up front, I don't wish to comment on that because I was involved in finding solutions and don't want to give feedback that might be uh, interpreted in any ways that uh, I would rather it not be. Uh, I would only say that had I been at last year in a position of influence, we would have had to make some changes in the program. With that, let's go. Uh, Incidentally, the number of the, the, the videos here were all taken in our museum, and this this beast was walking around Berrien Springs, uh, probably five six thousand years ago. It was it was uncovered in a uh, this mammoth was uncovered in by a local farmer, and it was turned out to be the most complete skeleton found in Michigan, and then uh, my predecessors put it together. And so that was a focus. Thank you, George. George Avor and I became very close friends because at the time, sometime during this time, George joined Andrew's chemistry as our biochemist. Pardon me? 69. Well, then we got there officially at the same time. Because my first year at Andrew's was 69, although I didn't arrive on campus till 70 because I was in Europe. Okay. Approaches, features, and student responses is what we are going to be focusing on. Uh, one of our best students, Danielle Teodorescu, who uh, actually may be not very far from us right now. Uh, up to 2017, she and her preacher husband were uh, involved in the Garden Grove Church. We came up with the following principles and concepts, etc., as we developed a stronger program uh, that involved origins all the way through. Uh, so we ge we accepted the Genesis account as inspired, and it was foundational to our approaches in understanding origins. The evidence for design in nature was presented at all levels, from introductory to advanced, as support for the existence and actions of a designer creator. We presented, respected, and practiced good science based on careful observation well-designed experimentation, and statistical evaluation. These approaches were used in classes and their laboratories, student projects, and research. They were based on, and I want to emphasize this, on our understanding of methodological naturalism. Uh, we used the approaches one uses to do good science, but uh, philosophical naturalism was a totally different uh, complaint. And we made sure our students understood those differences right from the beginning. Uh, genetic variability combined with natural selection has uh, been talked about here over uh, many, many times, and importantly so. Uh, we presented that as a reasonable ba basis for new speciation. If you want to think about it for a minute and you think of our standard approach to what happened post-flood, 
taking a small number of organisms into new environments they hadn't been in is immediately going to subject them to a strong selection. And so uh, we saw that happening, we taught it and respected it, but also we talked about the inadequacy of progressive inheritable genetic change in organisms, evolution, as a supportable explanation for the origin of the huge diversity found in living and fossil organisms, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, th this was the approach. We, we were in support not only in our teaching, but in our own personal practice as faithful uh, Adventist academics, uh, looking to our Creator as the origin of both where we came from, and if I may put it to say, where we hope to be going. We wanted our students to understand nature at all levels, functionally, marvelously, but also to remember how it had to get started. At the same time, in this area, you can't become so prescriptive that you allow just a very narrow range of student, uh, student responses. And so we wanted our students to leave primarily, our goal was to have them leave believing in the creatorship of God in a, with a relatively short time since creation and his involvement from the start. But seeing the outworking of that handiwork through the, the eyes and tools of, of good science. This will give you a little bit more of an idea of how we organized our whole program. This was developing by a three or four of us who had gone through the big, were young and were not part of the big exodus from some of the older faculty. And we took a while to put the pieces in place. And of course, we were open to changing and massaging as we felt we could become more and more effective. So in the first year, it was our Foundations of Biology course. And those of you who were here for my other presentation uh, realized that uh, teaching five days a week lecture in one lab a week for a year gives you substantial time to dig into this. And we wanted to do so in a way that faithfully prepared the students for even deeper exposure in the subsequent years, gave them background, but recognized right from the start the necessity for design and a designer. So in this particular course, uh, we featured all of the biological world, but with that understanding. Uh, from the start, we, we focused on this, but specifically in the course, there were two to three weeks that simply focused on origins as we understood it with the Creator, but at the same time was const making constant comparisons with the standard approach. In the second year, the students took genetics and cell and molecular biology. And I guess I can say very quickly, and you'll understand, that's all about design. As you look at the amazing mechanisms, and we're fortunate to have very effective faculty doing this. So, we to say it in the vernacular, random change followed by natural selection just can't do the whole 
of developing the modern, uh, leading to the modern picture we have in both the plant and animal world and in the marine world, etc. On the other hand, if you admit some smaller degree of change based on variability and selection, then you in some ways you're going into high gear and you're doing change faster than the standard evolutionary presentations at least at that time would ever think of uh, suggesting. So in some ways, I want to come back to the fruit fly, that's why I emphasized it. You might call it hyper-evolution to make small changes, but to make them more quickly. Uh, in my graduate program, I won't go into this, uh, my major professor realized within the first six months that I was a creationist. He clearly was not, but he was a very honest and he was a very honest men mentor, not, hard, not easy to get along with at all, but had wonderful ethics. And so when he realized who I was, he took it to the faculty and said, if this is a problem for him, we, he needs to know now, now, not three years from now, when he takes uh, the comprehensive exams, etc. I respected that immensely. They voted that uh, I would continue. But as a result of that discussion, I ended up reading about six of the major books in evolution, uh, including both Dubjotsky and Genetics and Evolution and George Gaylord Simpson, etc. I knew a lot more about it. I had something like bi-weekly discussions with the department chair who was a taxonomist, and he was the major evolutionist on the faculty. Uh, I profited from that, uh, and I might say I was fortunate that when it came to comprehensives, uh, only one faculty member tried to trip me up, and I still feel like it was a suggestion coming from above. I answered saying uh, my personal beliefs are based on my understanding of my religious background and Christianity rather than trying to uh, give them uh, give them convincing arguments why they were all wrong. Uh, one of my one of my quizzers and uh, we had very very tough comprehensives believe me now, I got through about 30 hours of written exams, then to be grilled by the whole faculty walking in and out. And uh, one of them asked me the question, tell me what angels looked like. Now, if you're a biologist, you would know that the artist, uh, if angels were dependent on locomotion like birds, their chests would have to have been this big because the flight muscles are all here. And uh, fortunately, I saw that one coming and uh, gave a, an acceptable, acceptable but uh, non-definitive exa example that it simply couldn't have been like the pictures if angels were flying around with wings. And the location of the wings and the body weight are all wrong. Uh, so they just wanted to make sure I understood that. Anyway, getting back to this, in the third year, uh, we had a uh, course in historical and philosophical biology. As our program developed, we were very, very, very fortunate to attract Tom Goodwin to our faculty, and he's a paleontologist. And he's done a wonderful job in being open with the problems and the solutions, but supporting creation from start to finish. But this is where we really addressed some of the toughest questions. And in the fourth year, the course I was involved in came. Following that, uh, it was a seminar based on readings, discussion, focused on central creation, evolution topics. Design obviously featured. A paper was presented by each student at the end, both in written and presentation form. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is designed to give you 
not teaching ev- evolutionary doctrine, but to, to give you uh, the way we approached some of the problems. Uh, and I have a totally hypothetical uh, situation here. We have, we have a deposit, including fossils, that, in these, these, as I said, everything's hy- hypothetical, but a radioactive clock said the fossils were uh, because of the measurement in the layer above the fossils uh, a little less than a million years old. That's, that's, we were saying that is the way the evolutionary work was done. We were not supporting what I'm showing, but if we had to deal with the fact that the deeper layers were aged by radioactive ideally aged by radioactive deposits that were older than the ones on the surface. Now, knowing that there are endless numbers of ways of finding difficulties with this, we felt quite uncomfortable with creating the radioactive measurements based, based on the fact they were using, in, for the most part, Techniques that ran submarines with nuclear radioactive engines, etc. And so we didn't try to get into and show how this radioactive aging had to be wrong because there, there was too much that agreed with the approaches used, the time measurements, uh, in any very contemporaneous sense. So we've, as I said, totally hypothetical. Three different layers. We have, if you will, evolving organisms going from that to that to that, or this, and changes in abundance at the same time. And these, uh, now I'll grant you that you don't often find these deposits like this in a single location. All I'm wanting to illustrate is uh, what we did. So, what does good science demonstrate? Radioactive ages of, of isotope containing deeper strata are older than the shallower strata. Uh, fossils containing strata, uh, fossil containing strata were laid down earlier than the isotope containing strata above them, etc. And so we had to deal with this because it's f- fully th- there in the textbooks. And as you guys know from being in this class, you can find all kinds of differences, etc. But the big picture uh, is difficult to say they are using poor science in making the measurements and locating the fossils. Uh, we we decided to then tell them good science, as notice it's quotes, proposes the simplest, most supportable interpretations. Thus, the best prop- proposition is that the two fossil lineages changed progressively over a period that is greater than 6.5 million years. Now, please read the next sentence. That's the only statement that you could make if you're using philosophical naturalism as a big picture. We were not using philosophical naturalism. But then the question was, what do you do? So how did we interpret this assemblage of information? The fossil layers and dates were real They're there, and the techniques are good enough to uh, be, uh, t- in other words, trying to pick at something that works contemporaneously as being wrong when it gives you a conclusion that you're not comfortable with is what we were trying to avoid. Rather, uh, the fossil layers and dates were real, but we withhold judgment, more data needed. Philosophical naturalism would present a picture that was inconsistent with our scriptural picture of creation. 
And we made that very clear and that we were with the scripturally consistent interpretation. But, and this is crucial, we would keep working to develop an understanding consistent with biblical creation using good science. And there is a wonderful example of that. What did keep working mean? Uh, how many of you are familiar with the fossil forests of Yellowstone? I, see, I know some of you are. Where you have a, a series of trees fossilized, and there are some 70 or 80 layers. You add, if you take the oldest tree in each layer as an indication of age, you add it up, you're... What, what's the number that was commonly given? 300,000. Yeah, 300,000. Much longer. And of course... In that particular area in Yellowstone, there are fossil bearing strata in, in higher elevations, lower elevations. But uh, Harold Coffin was a, uh, the spark plug here, and he was one of my very best friends, and my first boss, an inspiration of an individual Adventist who was about as fundamental as you could get, accepted. Uh, it, it accepted the validity of the Genesis account, etc. But his approach was to go back to the fossil forest and look for more data, which he did. And basically, he demonstrated that transport of the trees from other sources was really the only bet that was the best interpretation there are very strange things like the stumps or the, the incident there are many more horizontal logs than the small number of stumps but the pollen in those layers did not match the species of the trees in the layer and he came up with all of these kinds of interpretations he did such a th thorough job that the official explanation offered to the public by the National Park Service is based on his findings, and they present that fossil forest as, they don't say 100%, but clearly be, uh, transport from other sources being a very major factor. And that's what I'm wanting to say by going back and doing good science, rather than out of hand saying it doesn't agree with what I believe, what I'm sure is right, therefore I, it's just wrong. However, Going back to something I said earlier, I found that if I tried to say that to a church that had never seen me before, uh, they heard me picking on the validity of creation period, which hurt me. More importantly, it hurt my department. So, as I said, I, I quit trying to do that. Uh, it was too important uh, to allow myself to be misunderstood. Our, bi our biology majors are troubled by the interpretations of, in quotes, good science that do not support their faith in the biblical story of creation as presented in Genesis. Uh, you'll be hearing from several of our majors with a variety of takes on that, but without going further into reading, let me uh, simply note that these were all students in my uh, uh, capstone course and agreed that these video clips could be presented in the 2004 meetings in Colorado, the North American Division. And so that's why I have them, and uh, I think this is the first time I've made use of them since that time. Now, we're going to move into a section I'm calling not so good science. Uh, the macroevolutionary explanations uh, typically start out using procedures that, uh, when used correctly, represent good science. However, uh, they are also faced with the huge challenge of explaining the very sudden origin of very large changes in morphology of evolving groups of organisms. And need I 
do more than mention the Cambrian explosion, where you have actually in that time period dated 500 million years ago, all of the major animal phyla represented, even our phylum chordata is there. The problem with it is that none of those organisms you see in the Cambrian are represented in any way in extant organisms now. So in some ways the Cambrian is a two-edged sword. Uh, it's perhaps even more spectacular to think of how the flowering uh, plants came along, or maybe plants in general, uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms, etc., uh, because they just suddenly appear. And interestingly, uh, they all made pollen, but no one has found pollen in layers earlier, which if they were living at an earlier time, certainly the pollen would have found its way down into lower layers since it would be so easy to redistribute with water. But there, the uh, pollen in the layers containing the plant material is rich. So uh, that is a major problem for uh, macroevolution. I'm going to illustrate it in the following way. One of the dominant sea creatures during this time, during the Cambrian time, was uh, trilobites. They were, one of their dominant features were they had this series of appendages along the anterior posterior axis that were essentially functionally and structurally identical. They might be different sizes, but... Uh, there's no evidence for differentiation of these appendages along the anterior posterior axis, which is a major measurement supporting evolution, i.e. evolution happened as a similar range of appendages or structures became differentiated with specialized purposes. There is a really difficult uh, explanation here for evolution, because if you go back to the Devonian, you find insects with highly differentiated appendages from anterior to posterior. This actually is a silverfish, and it's in a, the Devonian takes you back to about 400 million years before present, according to the standard measurements. Uh, I, I apologize for the indistinction of the picture, but you have Circe at this end, you have very long antennae, you have uh, motile appendages, legs, etc. Uh, for insects, there are three pair consistently. And that's uh, one, one of the reasons for their belonging in a separate order. Anyway, uh, so you, get, you do get differentiation along the anterior posterior axis. But there are no intermediate forms. And that is huge, especially since insects have an exoskeleton which will survive uh, be, uh, well beyond the point of death and is one of the more easily fossilized types of, of uh, remains. It's not there. And uh, this huge gap. Uh, incidentally, insects are, if anything, the dominant animal today. There are more species of insects than all the other species of animals put together on the earth. Somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think it's 400,000 species of insects. Uh, that number could be off. But anyway, I want to stay with this for a little bit. This not-so-good science takes this marvelous uh, Nobel Prize winning research as an explanation. You realize that every cell in an organism, goodness, I'm running long, I'll have to bring this quick. Uh, every cell in a living organism uh, has 
uh, has all of the genes for every structure in the animal. The matter, the, 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 what is important is what leads to their expression. How is it that genes making antennae in the anterior are, are expressed, where genes making legs in the midrange uh, are differently expressed? Let's go down that a little bit further. Uh, there is a mutation called antennapedia in which the uh, the olfactory organ, organ uh, the antenna, is produced where a leg might have been produced. And antennapedia was discovered with, because, and I'll come back to, oh, pardon me, I'll keep going. There's another mutation with fruit flies called ultrabithorax. Almost all insects, except the dipterans, have two pair of wings. Diptera, two wing, have one pair. A single mutation creates a fruit fly with two pairs of wings. So obviously the genes for wings are there, but a structure called the halter, and I won't go into its function, is replaced because the gene which causes halters to be made mutates, and the default program is to make a wing. So, the, in my book, Not So Good Science, is, and its application to evolution, is that Hox genes can explain the diversity of appendages along the anterior posterior axis, but with no connectic evidence. Now, I'm going to go through this quickly. Here is an antenna. Here are the legs that are replaced by the antenna with a mutation in a Hox gene. So let's look at it like this. We're starting off with a homeotic or Hox gene, which in normal development uh, activates the antennapedia gene, and the <coughs> antennae can only be made by structural genes. Now, the Hox genes don't make proteins or stuff. They control other genes that then make those structures. And so the antennal structural genes are turned on by the influence of the antennapedia gene. And incidentally, that is turned on by regulatory molecules that occur during development. I won't go into that detail. In fact, you're coming back to that. Or I know you've been there already, but I won't. I won't take time to unwrap it this late date. So, when that mutates, what happens to the fruit fly is to express the, the structural genes for a leg. Now, it's quite obvious that the evolution would propose a leg is replaced by antennae in the head end due to the and uh, due to the Hox genes which don't make things they turn on groups of genes that do make things so clearly an antenna is a more recent adaptation than a leg and if you if it doesn't make antenna you sort of have a default program that makes legs. Uh, so, I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, this is now being used by some evolutionists as evidence for big, quick, dramatic change happening and explaining dimensions of evolution that are otherwise inexplicable. Uh, what's wrong with this scenario? Let's just keep going. Uh, coming back to this, let's look for a moment. The transformation of an antenna to a leg. Let's just look at their structure very briefly. The antenna has a very, very complex set of receptors that are so specific 
that uh, in fruit flies and other insects, for example, the female, when she's ready to be fertilized and lay fertile eggs, releases a pheromone, a chemical to the air, which is attractive. And males come trying to find her and reproduce. This is so good a system, and I won't go into it, but with the noctuid moths, there's evidence that the moth can respond to a single pheromone molecule. Well, how do they then follow a concentration gradient to find the originating female? They don't. When that is turned on, they fly upwind, which they can detect, until they get in closer where the concentration of the pheromone is such they can follow the concentration gradient. So can you get much more sensitive than one molecule? The evidence is very good for that. So while these are very complicated structures with that kind of sensitivity, the leg is pretty simple. Muscles moving joints. Okay, let's just get, uh, I've got some stuff on structure. In this picture, which is very poor, I didn't take time to download the, uh, the original video, but here we have a female releasing a pheromone inside of a cage, and there you have males, and in the video you'd see about six males around that cage trying to get inside. Okay, results of good, uh, not so good science takes the results of good science and project them to an evolutionary mechanism. Now I'm going to, I, I need to say this. Are the proposals for the kind of changes that evolution depends on testable in the scientific sense? How many of you have ever studied a science called experimental history? In other words, going back and trying to test the ideas of evolution can only be done by discussion. You can't set up an experiment that allows you to say this is very improbable, which is what good science would do, or it is, uh, we can't say it's improbable, therefore it may, it may have happened. Now, would it be logical for uh, using the sudden production of a leg up here, which is a primitive trait, to use antennapedia mutation, which allows the default program to express, to use that as a basis for understanding rapid evolution. No, it's just the opposite. But that's all they've got. And I want to, as we focused on that in the uh, class I taught. So the naturalism of philosophical starting point allows only naturalistic propositions for the causes of non reproducible natural phenomena that occurred in the past. It's untestable. Intelligent design is a priori excluded. The main point I'm making is much of the power of science based on testability and refutability is lost. In other words, it takes it out of the range of testable to trying to organize it logically. Uh, I am going to skip these quotes. These are from papers of four of the students, uh, four of the number of students in the class I was teaching, uh, which basically say in their words that they've looked at the evidence and they still feel that creation a relatively recent creation, is the best explanation. So let me end with this. Our goals were sustain, to sustain faith in the creator-designer and, very importantly, to have our students leave their, our program with what we call an intellectual patience, willing to wait for further resolution of the areas that we help them understand. 
rather than just saying, ah, can't be. Yes, we had some who did that, and it was very heartbreaking for us. I would say in general it was less than 10% of our graduates at the time they graduated. I can't speak for that afterwards. Anyway, that was a very important goal for us as Adventist educators, and uh, this only goes through about 2005. However, the program continues to have the same focus. Uh, my last year of chair was 2000, so that's it. I ran so long that uh, I hope I haven't uh, cramped too much. Yes, Ariel. <laughs> uh, nobody else is going to comment. I'll comment with. Uh, of course, I've watched this over the years. Yes, Ariel's been very close to this. Uh, uh, he and I have talked a lot beforehand. And, uh, I do want to say, Jack, that I appreciated that you were more, uh, I suppose I could use the term conservative without that sounding pejorative, um, than your colleagues uh, at Andrews, and I, I really appreciated that. Uh, the... Uh, one criticism I would say, uh, at least a bit critic, <clears throat> uh, the issue uh, is not so much what does science say as what is truth. The issue, the basic issue is broader than that. And uh, you folks have taken a good attitude towards science, and I think and tried to do what you could with science, but you neglected, I think, to evaluate science as an incomplete approach to truth. Uh, Can I respond? It, uh, there's a reality beyond what we can see in the material world. And... Uh, so yeah, I, I, I would have been happier if uh, uh, there had been in there uh, a thorough evaluation of the philosophy of science, of the history of science, and uh, of the strengths and weaknesses of science so the student would get a broader approach uh, to what he was dealing with here. Uh, uh, nature is entitled to its data, it is entitled to present what it wants in terms of that restricted view, but it has to be in the context of this is a restricted view of reality. And uh, so I, uh, you know, a broader approach I think we would, uh, I'd be a little, a little happier with, but uh, uh, I, I I'm not I, sure. I could, be, I, could be, I could be wrong in this. I'm not sure where you got the, got the idea that the broader view wasn't central to our whole program. It, uh, I, I <laughs> hope to project to you that we wanted them to be able to deal with what many presented as conflicts to remain on the side <laughs> of understanding God as creator as an intelligent designer and that the philosophical aspect of philosophical naturalism, we call it in here a lot, uh, has no real foundation mm -hmm. to build on. Mm -hmm. That's the way we left uh, to When I mentioned the intellectual patience, we wanted them to be able to deal with the overwhelming interpretations of others by saying, no, my understanding of God's creatorship, and I understand the weaknesses, I kind of alluded to that, saying all of, all of this philosophical naturalism makes proposals 
that are totally outside of the, the ability of science to evaluate. And we wanted our students to stay with something that you can't also do experimental in the laboratory, but mm -hmm. makes much more sense with a designer. And then we've, of course, added to that, in both in our lives and in our teaching, that designer is also our savior. And we have so much to be thankful for that. Uh, we were we were happy, but not as happy when a student like uh, Danny finished with with some clearly uh, expressed doubts. But to watch his life since, it's been exemplary as an Adventist. Yeah, I I, I appreciate that, uh, and uh, but I would. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd been happier if uh, it pointed out that philosophical naturalism is not the environment in which modern science was established, that you can do science by including God in the equation. Uh, well, of course. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I wasn't going down that road because I ran yeah. over time anyway. We've done that over yeah. and over and over again. And what you're saying was central to to the member. There were all of us talking about how we did it at each level. And it was brought together as they went further down the road with our goal of them leaving with, and my term of intellectual patience is, realizing mm -hmm. they there are things that are difficult to explain, but if you look at the explanations based on philosophical naturalism, they're totally unsupported but are, and are only make sense because anything else is excluded out of hand. This is what you're referring to. It's not an environment for science. It's an environment for interpreting, well, we're here, it must have been this way, which is their telling argument because they take any creator out period. Our students pretty much all left with that. And if you listen carefully to what Tat and I and Danielle were saying, I, at least I heard that. I, I don't mean in any way, we've had long-term discussions and uh, we're on the same page actually. Uh, the statement, my personal way of working through all this is the Bible, and Alan White. I mean, I don't have the background to get into it like you folks do. So the Bible and Alan White is my guide. I don't know what else would be my guide, but I listened to the class, and I love what you did at Andrews. Uh, where was Andrews headed before you set up the program? Allow me to defer. I'm, there, there's some real problems. I was too involved in them to want to say much. Uh, okay, well, that's fair enough. Uh, but I would say I'm in full agreement. What you were saying, your guide is, was totally part of what we're doing. In our historical and philosophical, Ellen White was used. Uh, the Bible is used constantly. Uh, neither of these are scientific sources. But our point was, as Ariel said, there's nothing about origins that can be tested scientifically other than something like the peppered moth evolution uh, in, in England where moths went from white, white colored to dark colored because the trees went from light colored to dark colored because of the Industrial Revolution with all the coal smoke being de deposited. And mm. there were experiments done which they would show that moths, light moths on a dark background would be fed, would be eaten faster by birds than uh, dark and dark or light on light. Uh, that's about as far as experimental science has gone in demonstrating this aspect of evolution. And that's what we've, that is what really is, is underneath our statement of uh, a philosophical patience. I like that. And uh, I think I learned this from Dr. Geem in this class, that you never shoot at a moving target. 
you know, this is where someone is right now today, and you want to get them because they don't exactly answer every question you have, or they may believe a little different, but you don't try to kill them over there. They're moving, constantly <laughs> moving, and we've seen evidence in this class of people steeped in evolution who have moved out of it from where they were. Yes. So I'm glad we didn't try to do them in here and let the Holy Spirit guide them out there. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you ever had a, uh, any students that questioned a, a literal six-day, 24-hour creation and um, what you perceive to be the the hang up in that regard is there was there any piece of science they were holding on to that precluded that belief? Uh, our fundamental position was the Genesis story of creation. Did we have students who rejected that? Of course. And if they came through our program closer to reconnecting with the Creator without seeing the whole picture the way we did, we felt that was extremely important. And we had a few, frankly, uh, since I'm not using names, you could pick them out ahead of time in many cases, they were always the intellectual critics of everything. But there wasn't a, any particular piece of science that they were holding on to that um, anchored them in a position of long age creation, for instance. I, I, that is an approach that would be very difficult to focus on and make it kind of yes or no in an environment like ours. Uh, l let me just ask you simply, and, and we deal with Tell me specific fossil or geological evidence that leads you to a seven-day creation. The, that wouldn't be the basis of my faith. That's my personal answer. Yeah, of course. My, my faith doesn't but, come from the, but the whether geological it's, it's record. seven days or seven weeks or seven years is not something you can go to nature and try to get a direct answer. Right. And I think the flip side of that coin is true. Is there anything in good science that would preclude a belief in a literal six-day, 24-hour creation? Well, I don't think it would be possible to find evidence that would do that. Well, it hasn't. If it, if it hasn't shown itself yet. I, well, I'm not sure what there is in the fossil record that could delineate 24-hour periods. Or, or any record, for that matter. E exactly. Jack? Yes. One of the um, <clears throat> triumphs of biology is the discovery of the importance of ecology. The interconnected... Uh, nature of all aspects of life on, 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 in a biosphere. It is now known that no single organism is capable of survival by itself. And despite of the, uh, the major impression that we are fighting for survival and, and that's kind of the driving force, that is actually the, the opposite is true, that organisms, we all support another organism, and we can illustrate it in many, many ways. Life is not possible in the absence of the biosphere, no single organism. So where do I go with that? To the seventh-day creation. The biosphere could not have come into existence and be sustained unless it all came into existence very, very rapidly, okay? Just from the very existence of the biosphere, we make a, it makes a very strong argument for a rapid creation of all the supporting systems. Agreed. Now, on another comment was I had the privilege of going on sabbatical one year to UCLA, doing research there, but 
UCLA in that year had a symposium on evolution, very successful, lots of attendance. It seems that the, co the topic of evolution is extremely uh, interesting to most scientists, and they want to hear. And uh, one of the featured speaker was Dr. Ernst Mayer, gentleman. I think I believe he's a systematic biologist, and he's really one of the icons of evolution. Absolutely. So he gave a long lecture, which I'm afraid my eyes glazed over since I didn't have the background. But I've when heard he was, I know what you mean. But but <laughs> he. he the last few sentences, all of a sudden, you know, I was dozing off uh, on top of everything else. Uh, suddenly I came awake. He says, after talking about systematic biology, he says, but my firm belief in evolution comes from the discoveries of molecular biology, that it is across all species, the, the mechanisms of molecular biology, the way it works, is evident, and that gives me faith in evolution. I said to myself as I was going out, shaking my head, well, this is the very evidence that I as a creationist have. Molecular biology strengthens my own belief in the creator, the common designer. But there was Dr. Mayer who also used this as his <laughs> support for evolution. I just want to share Yes, of course, and uh, it's there, and if you're using the general dominant philosophy, you have to make that statement because there's no other possible interpretation, and that's where the argument comes down to. You can only deal with a naturalistic explanation because a priority, the others, a priori, the others are all excluded. They can't be because I know they can't be. The, the, the box of evolution forces biologists to connect every organism, all the million species. Somehow you have to make the connection. All the organisms have to be connected somehow. A creationist is free to say, well, they have separate origins. You don't have to connect them. What, what, an, another example I used in the presentation, which our students also saw through immediately was based on using the antenopedia mutation as evidence for very rapid evolution because it's going backwards. It went back to the primitive. And the fact that you could do that in one step, if you want to get to it, is evidence against because you have no evidence of forward addition of function by the single, by simple mutation in a Hox gene. It's not there. But yet they take it there because, after all, that's the only explanation. So quick reversion backwards is evidence for forward evolution. It's illogical. But unrecognized, uh, unrecognized, and that's the tragedy the ability to not recognize evidence that's contradictory. Go ahead. Me again. I want to say I, I very much appreciate your, um, your presentation here and uh, the approach. Uh, you raised the question, is there any evidence for six-day creation? And... Uh, that God did it in six days and so on. I, I can't come up with anything that direct. Uh, is there evidence for a recent creation? There the data gets pretty, comp pretty compelling. Totally, and that's, we were very and pleased that you heard the students say that's what they left believe, with believing. Said, uh, and so uh, uh, you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. Precisely. Uh, type of thing. I would say that the presence of paraconformities is uh, a very compelling uh, challenge 
to to the long geological ages. I would say the presence of uh, carbon fourteen and so many of these older fossils oh. is getting to be very compelling. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and uh, I would say the paucity of fossil man suggests that he hasn't been around that long uh, compared to what the geological uh, record <laughs> says and so on. So uh, we're not without significant evidence uh, that the biblical uh, record could be true could be true. And even more but, strongly is more consistent with. Yes. The, uh, I would say that uh, when you look at the broader picture uh, beyond what uh, science shows, and you know, I, I love science uh, and so on, but I'm forced, uh, I'm forced to think that there's got to be something beyond this because it's leave so many questions unanswered like you know why do I think that's right and wrong and uh, of course our consciousness and so on all these things uh, I'm, I'm forced by my science itself strictly science within philosophical naturalism to say uh, the data is more in favor of a designer than against a designer Absolutely. If there is a designer uh, that involved uh, thinking and so on, I'd expect him to communicate with us. Uh, that seems more reasonable to me than to have him like a Howard Hughes going off and, and becoming a recluse after he'd done all his creation. It seems more reasonable. Uh, if I look for a message from that designer, the Bible makes more sense than all the other sacred writings that I see about and so on. Uh, I expect a message. That one seems most reasonable. That one says six-day creation, fairly recent. Uh, this is not a matter of blind faith. It's not a matter of waiting for solutions to show up and so on. It's uh, at least in my mind, and of course my mind is, is a very poor example of how to go, but uh, in my mind it is a reasonable position and it is, is the one that uh, logically will follow. It's, it's not a matter of blind faith. Absolutely. And as you've pointed out, and I've wanted to communicate a recent r rapid creation fits. Our, our comment was, my comment was, and when students asked, I, it was seven little 24-hour days, uh, which we fully accepted as the inspired record, but were sure that we would not find physical evidence for when you look around and so but short and quick certainly was and that's where we wanted our students to to be in other words a position that is that a seven day creation fits in with beautifully even though you can't say here is the evidence for that piece I, I can will say one other thing, um, and that is that I feel for you in a certain sense because you are working with a, an incomplete database. Uh, not that we have a complete database now, but I think it's a little more complete. And I think that it's a lot easier today to make the case for a short age creation and therefore why not six days? Then, uh, exactly. Then it was. I mean, your your coverage years were up to two thousand five. Um, carbon fourteen really didn't become a major experimental thing until it was 
uh, the data was published in 2003 from the ICR. Uh, before that, you had to survey the literature, and although the literature kind of could lean you in the direction, maybe a little bit of uh, residual carbon-14, there wasn't, there weren't any experiments that were deliberately designed to test that. And so you were de dealing with a, you know, an era bef in mostly. Uh, almost completely before carbon-14. Um, a lot of things that are now here that, for example, the, uh, the evidence for mitochondrial EVE and now mitochondrial barcodes, which cover all creatures, starting to look like uh, recent uh, species creation, of however that worked. And then uh, Y chromosomes that are, you know, strong evidence for uh, chimpanzees and humans not being uh, descended from the same uh, those are those are post your era exactly and, and radiometric dating in general seemed certainly the way it was presented seemed to be pretty strong evidence for long ages um, and so I mean, you know, looking at your slides, you can see that you're struggling against the current on that particular area. Um, I think it's much less, uh, uh, much less coercive than it was um, back then. I I agree with you, and I, I want to comment personally. I I shared this with you, but after the church's general meetings over three years with respect to origins and I don't want to go into detail, I saw those within the church who wanted to control all aspects of thinking about it and have the only thing exception was their stamp of a particular flavor, not whether it was right or wrong. And frankly, I got so upset. I'd been very close to it. I walked away. Coming back to this class is my first journey back in over 10 years. I didn't become an evolutionist. I believed what I believed, but I was so upset with what the impact of those who were, didn't care whether they were well informed, they had all the truth. I was so upset with it, I just didn't want any more part of it. Because I saw that approach, because I was so experienced with knowing how it would affect the young people I loved serving. And I knew that there would be a significant number, including at least one of the presenters here. If that had come, they might have been a part of the ones going out the door. And those who tried to determine that the, you had to have a, 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 an official stamp of the church in order to be able to do it, and uh, some of us ran a rear guard against the signature for all, everybody teaching science in advance was signing on because they got the message that if they did that, they'd have probably two-thirds fewer science teachers. We would have walked away. So I thank you for this course and bringing me back. Well, part of that is a philosophy that says that the seal of God, in contrast to the mark of the beast, can only be in the forehead. That means you have to convince people. It's not enough to make sure that they obey if they're going to stay employed. <laughs> yes. And it's a sure prescription to lose many more of the new generation. Yes. Uh, again, thank you very much for your presentation. My pleasure.